It's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, first time in Ann Arbor, so very happy to be here. And yet, as you might imagine from someone whose profile picture is Brutus Buckeye, uh, there are so also some mixed emotions. Um, so, uh, as, as Phoebe talked about, emotions can come in a variety, uh, a range of, of varieties. Also, we saw that uh, from Susan. Uh, and so, for dimensional models, um, the goal is to take this bewildering array and reduce it to some number of dimensions, uh, as Phoebe mentioned. So, a uh, prominent model, in addition to Russell's model, which we'll discuss in a moment, is Watson and Tulligan's positive and negative affect model. Uh, and so you can see that we've got, uh, they focus on these two dimensions of positive activation and negative activation. Uh, and this uh, allows opportunity for emotion blends, um, both in terms of same valence emotions, because we can see here that they are neighboring emotions like uh, elated and happy. Uh, and so th these are, these are data-driven models. They are based on factor analyses of emotion ratings. So the reason why elated is where it is and happy is where it is is because when you look at correlation matrices of, of, of people uh, uh, rating the intensity of these emotions, they tend to be positively correlated. So uh, certainly uh, uh, makes sense of, uh, of blends of same valence emotions, but there's this other type of blend of, of emotions, uh, which are opposite valence emotions, positive and negative emotions. And just uh, it, for my own terminology, I call these types of emotion blends mixed emotions. Uh, but you know, we all have different terms. This is, this is how I uh, uh, use the term. Um, and th these models also allow for opposite valence emotions. So for instance, if we have high positive activation and high negative activation, they're not too close to each other, but they're only 90 degrees away, giving rise to the opportunity for mixed emotions of being excited and distressed. Um, and uh, we can actually address this with the, uh, we can assess these sorts of things with the PANA scales, uh, the most frequently used measures of emotion in the history of the universe. Um, and, uh, I checked last night, they're up to 19,207 citations. If I were to check again, it'd probably be up to 19,208. Um, very widely used. Usually people don't look at the, the, the relationships between uh, uh, positive and negative affect um, in, when they're using the PANAS. Um, but uh, there is some, uh, as you might expect, there are some stimuli that lead to elevations in both positive and negative activation. So recent finding uh, where participants uh, rated their p uh, PA and their NA, uh, watched uh, a, an erotic film, uh, and then rated their PA and NA again. Half of the participants showed elevations uh, pre versus post uh, in both positive activation and negative activation. So sh uh, uh, we see here these emotion blends in the terms of in terms of opposite valence emotions. Um, and uh, there's also the circumplex model, uh, which uh, it's, it's often thought that there's a great deal of uh, disagreement between these two models. Um, both Watson and Tulligan and Russell actually recognize that, that these models are largely similar. There are some important differences, but when you look at the two models, you see that the, the emotions in the two basically fall at the same point. And all that, different, all that differs is, the, is, is, is that uh, uh, Russell focuses, as Phoebe told us, on arousal or activation and valence, whereas Watson and Telegan just rotate the axes 45 degrees. Um, but importantly, both of them feature this bipolar valence dimension. And you see that happiness and sadness occupy polar opposite ends of that valence dimension. Um, so they're pretty similar in terms of their conceptualization of these paradigmatic positive and negative emotions, happiness and sadness. Um, uh, and Watson and Telligan uh, contend, when, if we think about two emotions that are at opposite ends of a bipolar continuum, we're going to conceptualize them as being perfectly negatively correlated, at least conceptually. Of course, when we collect data, there's error variance and everything else. But at least conceptually, we're going to predict a perfectly negative correlation between happiness and sadness. Um, and this makes sense uh, it, until you think about it a little bit more, um, because 
if we contend that there's a perfect negative correlation, what we are saying is that you cannot be neutral. You cannot be neither happy nor sad. And of course, that, that isn't the case. Um, Russell recognized this in uh, 1999, recognized that what a bipolar model predicts is not a perfect negative correlation between happiness and sadness, but rather that the two are going to be mutually exclusive. In the same way that you can't feel hot and cold at the same time, happiness and sadness are going to be mutually exclusive so that you can feel neutral you can feel some amount of happiness you can feel some amount of sadness but you're never going to venture your affective state is never going to fall into the interior of this space where you're experiencing these mixed emotions of happiness and sadness so circumplex allows for any number of opposite valence emotions to co-occur but not polar opposites not happiness and sadness um, in contrast, there's another model, the out of space model, which originated in uh, attitudes research, um, which contends that positivity and negativity are separable, gives rise to attitudinal ambivalence, attitudinal ambivalence towards capital punishment, toward abortion, what have you. In my research, what I've tried to do is see whether we can also use the evaluative space model to better understand emotional experience. Uh, and so if we, if we apply the evaluative space model to emotions, it raises the possibility that maybe we can experience these mixed emotions of happiness and sadness. We can fall in the interior of this space. Um, so we've got these competing hypotheses. And so in all of my research, I am focused specifically on happiness and sadness. Um, all sorts of other mixed emotions. Uh, for me, I'm interested in happiness and sadness because they provide tests of these competing hypotheses uh, of these three different dimensional models. And so how are we going to uh, figure out whether people can feel happy and sad at the same time? Uh, Russell started out very simply. He said, well, um, all we do is we have to ask people, how do you feel right now at this very moment? And we see whether they tell us that they're feeling both happy and sad. Um, and uh, uh, so we, we're not going to compute the correlation between the two measures. That's not going to tell us about the answer to this question. Instead, we're just going to see whether they tell us that they're feeling both happy and sad. Um, in a classroom setting, when uh, they collected these data, they found that only 10% of people reported these mixed emotions of happiness and sadness. And when we think about measurement error, when we think about acquiescence biases, 10% uh, uh, of people saying yes to both of these questions is pretty close to 0%. Um, so, initial evidence then that, you know, happiness and sadness are mutually exclusive um, in a classroom setting. But, uh, you know, as Susan mentioned, it, we, 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 experience, we, we go through life experiencing a variety of different situations. And so, what happens in more uh, emotionally complex, bittersweet situations? Uh, so, here's Russell and Carol's data. 10% of people are reporting mixed emotions. Um, uh, Pete McGraw and I um, um, went to a movie theater uh, and, uh, and we recorded people's happiness and sadness and also a variety of other filler emotions essentially. Before the film, um, only 10% of people reported mixed emotions, replicating this idea that in most situations, happiness and sadness are mutually exclusive. Um, but uh, uh, we also surveyed people after the film, and this wasn't just any film, this was uh, uh, Life is Beautiful, which if you haven't seen it, is a tragic comedy. It, it's, it's, it's a comedy, but it's one that's set in a concentration camp. And it's about this father's uh, uh, attempts to keep his son alive and unaware of their plight uh, in this concentration camp. Um, after the film, uh, uh, we surveyed another uh, uh, group of participants, and what we found is that here 44% of them uh, reported mixed emotions, uh, so uh, quite a few more. Um, and then we tried to say, well, wh what about other types of situations that might elicit mixed emotions? Um, and a, a blind spot in our research is that we really haven't been interested in appraisal patterns. There are appraisal patterns giving rise to these emotions. Um, we've been just interested in the experience itself, interested in measuring these emotions, so haven't really uh, been formally interested in what it is about these situations. We were just looking to see what sorts of situations might elicit mixed emotions. We found that on a typical typical day at Ohio State, few people reported mixed emotions. But on their move out day, freshmen on their move out day, they turn in their key. Uh, we uh, have someone hand them a questionnaire. 
40, 54% of them reported mixed emotions. A typical day at University of Chicago, um, uh, uh, people are less likely, not terribly likely to report mixed emotions. Chicago students are a little bit, well, let's just move on. Um, uh, but on graduation day, uh, they've got their caps and gowns and all the rest. They have survived the University of Chicago. And uh, now half of them reported mixed emotions of happiness and sadness. Um, so, now there are alternative uh, interpretations that we, that, that we want to deal with. One is that our, our measures may have been reactive. We are asking them, do you feel happy? Do you feel sad? Maybe by asking the question, they say, well, you know, now that you think about it. Um, so, uh, in order to address these alternative interpretations, uh, uh, we now bring people into the lab. We bring them in for a foreign language comprehension study. We then have them watch a 20-minute clip from Life is Beautiful, subtitle. Um, we have them watch a control clip, which features a number of positive scenes and then negative scenes, but no bittersweet scenes, and then a bittersweet clip where we include a lot of these bittersweet scenes from the film. And then we just ask them, are you feeling any emotions right now? And if they say yes, then, then, then the, the computer says, okay, identify one of those emotions, and then do you, are you feeling any others? And if they say yes, we say, okay, identify another one. And, and they, this goes on until they say, no, I'm not feeling anymore, uh, leave me alone. And then, and then what, what we do is we just look and say, do they list as synonyms of happiness? Do they list synonyms of sadness? Um, and what we find after the control clip is no one did. Um, they were just mostly sad because you know, the, the film ended sadly. Um, but after the bittersweet clip, 34% of them, uh, you know, they, they said, I am feeling happy. We didn't give them that word, they gave it to us. I am feeling sad, uh, both of those. Um, all right, so, so this, uh, studies like this address uh, uh, concerns that our measures were reactive. Um, uh, 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 Phoebe mentioned, you know, vacillation. Um, a circumplex model, Watson and Tulligan model, can easily accommodate people just moving back and forth between happiness and sadness. Emotions change. Um, so what we need to do to, to, to figure out whether people are uh, uh, feeling happy and sad at the same time is get measures with greater temporal resolution. We've done this in a couple of ways. Uh, uh, one that we do is we have people come in and on the top half of the screen uh, you can see uh, that sh she is watching the film. On the bottom half of the screen you see this grid and she's got her hand on the mouse. And so this grid is what we call the evaluative space grid. Uh, and um, uh, it allows people to report how happy they are and how sad they are. Um, and they just move around in the grid. They don't press any buttons. Every second, every half second, we are recording where the, which cell they're in. And so we are able to measure uh, 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 the extent to which they are happy and the extent to which they are sad. Um, here's just an illustrative participant. Um, over the course of this 20 minute movie, we can see that their happiness is changing. Um, and we can see that their sadness is changing. Okay, so what we need to do is quantify mixed emotions here, and we do this with, uh, uh, with a measure uh, adapted from the attitudes literature by Shemak, um, and it's just called min, and it's the minimum at any given point of someone's happiness and sadness ratings. So if you're, uh, not, if you're feeling just one or the other, the smaller of those two numbers, of course, is zero. But the farther you move into the interior of the grid, the higher this, uh, this score uh, goes. Um, all the way up until four, all right, on, on, this, on this scale. Um, so this is one of the types of measures I suspect that Igor was talking about earlier. Uh, just one measure of what we call mixed emotions, but uh, of course there are gonna be other, uh, other, other uh, perspectives on uh, mixed emotions calling for different measures. This is the one that's useful for testing our hypotheses. Um, and so we can take this uh, luster of participants' ratings again, and we can see that between minutes six and eight, this is an occasion where it looks like the person was moving into the interior of the grid, and sure enough, this is reflected in their min ratings. We can see that usually min is at zero, but in these occasions where they're moving into the interior of the space, it is elevated. All right. So, um, now again, we've got people who watch the control <coughs> clip and others who watch the bittersweet clip, and we look at the mean min ratings during the control clip, and they basically are flatlined uh, uh, over the course of that entire 20 minutes. 
In contrast, when we look at the mean min ratings in collapsed across subjects, what we see is that during bittersweet clip, we see some elevations here and there during bittersweet portions of the film. And when we treat these data uh, with participant as the unit of analysis, we see that the median participant, because these are terribly skewed distributions, uh, the median participant uh, reports uh, has a higher min score during the bittersweet clip than during the control clip. Um, so, um, we've addressed then a couple of alternative interpretations, reactive measures, vacillation, um, and, but if people can feel happy and sad at the same time, uh, this should show up in measures other than self-reports. And so, uh, one approach is to look at facial expressions of mixed emotions, uh, because in general, uh, um, uh, the, the experience of emotion is going to be uh, uh, correlated with your, your facial expression of emotion. Um, and so uh, this is this is new work um, that 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 uh, I think this study was just done last spring. Um, and so we had 98 participants. We had them watch two different film clips. Uh, one was a four-minute bittersweet clip from Life is Beautiful, and then another one was a, a, a clip from Steel Magnolias that's often used. Uh, we added a bit at the beginning, uh, a, a, a neutral uh, scene, and then an, an amusing scene, and then a funeral scene, which is of course an unpleasant scene. Um, uh, but, it, but it did earn Sally Field an Oscar for whatever that's worth. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and then the measures that we collected, first we, we measured the Avada Space Grid, just like in the previous study that I mentioned, but we also uh, got videotapes, uh, of video uh, recordings of them so that we could get their facial expressions. Uh, and so here's an illustrative pilot participant, and here's also a picture of a cherry tree, because you know, when you see Study, when you see data like this in talks, it's always cherry picked. Most participants, <laughs> most participants are pretty flat most of the time. All right, um, this is a participant who uh, who is uh, particularly uh, uh, expressive uh, with her face. Okay, so you can see pretty complicated facial expressions here. Um, you know, Phoebe showed the, 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 the Ekman faces. This isn't the Ekman face, right? <laughs> um, and uh, so what do we do with these data? Um, well, uh, we had four naive judges. They, they have n know nothing about the study. They uh, are just watching muted video clips. Um, they know nothing about the stimuli that people watched. And they, they spent the semester watching all participants' videos, so it was a, it was a challenging uh, uh, semester for them. Um, and while they watched the videos of the participants' faces, they moved around in the grid to report how they thought the participant was, what they thought the participant was expressing. All right, so we can do the same thing with the judges' data that we do with the participants' own data in terms of figuring out how far into the interior of the space, if at all, they're moving uh, when they are watching and making sense of the participant's face, all right? Um, so, um, here's these data. It, the, first, we'll start with the self-report ratings from the grid, uh, like we saw before, and we see that during Steel Magnolias, when we look at min scores, uh, they are quite low. Here, uh, what, we're on a scale from zero to one, as opposed to a scale from zero to four. Uh, and um, we see that it's quite low near baseline throughout all three of these scenes. But during the bittersweet scene, what we see, that particularly during the second half of the scene, uh, where the father is doing a, a, a very amusing mistranslation of, of guards, of, of, of the German guards that they are giving to new arrivals at the camp. <coughs> um, and so we see much higher min scores during Life is Beautiful, the bittersweet scenes, than during the other three types of scenes. Um, and so now this is just a replication. We see that rarely do people report mixed emotions, but sometimes they do. And now the, the critical question is what do the judges see? What do the judges detect when they are seeing the participants' facial expressions? Uh, and all, during the uh, neutral scenes, or I'm sorry, during the uh, Steel Magnolia scenes, they, see, they detect very little mixed emotions. During the Life is Beautiful scene, um, they appear to be detecting more mixed emotions. Uh, and you 
you can see that the time course here tracks pretty well the time course of the self-reports. We're also seeing that the scale is very low here. In theory, if a judge looked at a face and moved all the way into the top right corner, they would get a one. This is not where we are. We are at a point zero zero five here. So very small differences. Um, but they are statistically significant difference. When we treat subject as the unit of analysis, what we find is that 76% of participants expressed more mixed emotions during the bittersweet scene than during the neutral scene. 62% uh, 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 did so more during the bittersweet than during the amusing scene, and 70% expressed more mixed emotions during the bittersweet scene than during the funeral scene. All right, um, so um, what these data do is they, they provide some evidence beyond self-reports that people can report mixed emotions. But I, I, ha I still have a question mark after this one because we had some other judges who did a different task uh, that, that I don't have time to, to talk about, um, but their data did not provide the same uh, evidence uh, for mixed emotions in the face that, that, that the grid judges did. So this, isn't, this is an open question. We're getting some more data now uh, with a different test to tr try to pin this down. Um, and, and I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I do hope that this question mark, I get to remove it soon. And I don't care whether I remove it in such a way that the data do provide evidence for mixed emotions or that they don't. Um, that's not my job. My job is just to provide these strong tests and see what the data say. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, and, but so, so now what we can do is take a look at these data and look at the evidence for uh, uh, the implications for the structure of affect. Ooh, and I gotta, I gotta wrap up. Um, but uh, people rarely report mixed emotions, but sometimes they do, and so we need the, the evaluative space model uh, to understand this, but the evaluative space model isn't gonna provide a complete theory of the structure of affect. I think maybe what we need is some sort of theoretical integration like this, where we do sometimes need, in emotionally complex situations, the uh, uh, three dimensions to understand uh, uh, the structure of affect, and we've we've already seen that. Uh, you know, in Susan's talk, we saw that two dimensions isn't enough, and I think in bittersweet situations like this, two dimensions won't be enough either. All right, and that's all I got.